So it's my great pleasure to introduce Hadas Kress Gazit uh, from Cornell University. Uh, Hadas is a uh, UPenn PhD. She's like starting from her uh, thesis work. She's been a leader in applying formal methods, especially uh, program synthesis to robotics problems, anything from uh, soft robots to robot swarms, uh, and most recently HRI. Uh, many of us in HRI have learned kind of about these methods from Hadas, uh, especially this uh, doctoral seminar from two years ago has been very influential. It's kind of a, a subfield of HRI now, many of us thinking about these things. Um, so she's been recognized in many ways. Uh, she's an IEEE fellow. She's on the RSS board, uh, has gotten many awards, including early career ones. Um, and she's been an advocate and ally for uh, minorities in our field, uh, notably uh, starting the inclusion at RSS, which many other conferences are now following. Um, personally, she's been an amazing mentor to me. <laughs> as a kind of early faculty. Um, last time I, was, I saw Hadas was at Ichikai. Uh, it was kind of my last uh, international uh, travel and she was giving the keynote talk. Um, so it hasn't been that long that I caught up with her work but it's always a pleasure. And I wanted to share it with everybody. So that's how this talk uh, came about. Uh, so welcome Hadas. Thank you, Maya. That was extremely kind um, and, and very, you know, feel, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, so hi everyone, uh, as, as Maya mentioned, I'm Hadas Kaskazik. Um, I want to talk about synthesis for robots, but I'm going to take a few tangents just because, you know, life. So first tangent, um, let me first start by saying I don't get memes, or rather I didn't get memes until the fall of 2020 when I had a TA that is a, her superpower is memes. And I used a lot of memes to teach, well, not a lot, but to, to teach mechatronics. Um, but I really want to start with saying that um, this has been a year. Uh, it has been an uh, exhausting year. Uh, anything from um, the Black Lives Matters movement and all the institutional racism that people are starting to realize or, or is becoming a lot more um, front and center for people and, and many, people's who, many people who aren't necessarily uh, aware of it. Um, Anti-Asian racism, COVID, for people who have a family in India, I hope they're doing well. Uh, this is, you know, the last few weeks, last week or so, um, have been really heartbreaking. So yeah, so just uh, this was a precursor to say that uh, this year has been terrible. Uh, some people are doing well, most of us are not. And don't, uh, this is my uh, uh, public service announcement in terms of it will get better. Um, we just need to kind of plow through it, so. As engineers, we like to solve problems, and you know the whole whatever happened with the vaccine was definitely a way to showing engineering and, and uh, um, science, you know, doing an amazing thing. Um, but there's something that we just we just have to wait. So um, if you're not productive, if you're struggling with mental health, all these things are we are you know we know, and we we are all in the same boat. All right. That being said. My next tangent is robotics at Cornell, because while I'm here and I have your, your ear, we all are always looking for students and postdocs and faculty. So as, as you can see Tapo up there on, on, on the right hand side, uh, I believe he's on, in this process of moving from Seattle to Ithaca right now. So yeah, so I'm, uh, I have met him many times over Zoom. I am very much looking forward to meeting him in person. That would be fun. So what do you see here? You see here the robotics faculty at Cornell. Oh, we span um, three colleges. So uh, engineering, computer information science, and human ecology. The, the bottom DEA, this is design and environmental analysis. Um, we span two, two campuses. So this is the Ithaca. So you can see kind of all my, also my background. Ithaca is beautiful. It's gorgeous, if you, if you will. And then also the tech campus, which is on Roosevelt Island in New York City, which is a newer campus. Um, and some of our faculty are there. So yeah, so uh, um, yeah, I wanted you to get a little bit of a feel for, for how diverse and how, how uh, um, in terms of many dimensions, uh, the robotics faculty is at, and, and students are at Cornell. Okay, so that was two tangents. Let me kind of go back to the um, synthesis. What is synthesis for robots? So it's always good to start with a video or with a couple of videos. And what I wanna show here 
is a project that was a collaboration with uh, Mark Yim at Penn and Mark Campbell at Cornell and their students, or rather collaboration between our students and us kind of helping out when we could, um, on modular robots. So what you're gonna, I'm gonna run two videos and I'm gonna run them at, kind of at the same time. And you're gonna see very different behaviors. Now, what I wanna emphasize here is that they have the same task. So look for a pink tag. If you find one, go there and drop off the object. We didn't give it a natural language. We used logic, with temporal logic, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But um, exact same task, exact same set of building blocks. So abstractions, I'll get to that. And, what do you, and it's fully autonomous. So we basically uh, provide a specification, hit enter, and, um, and let it run. And what you're going to see is you're going to see two different behaviors. And the reason it's two different behaviors is because these robots are operating in different environments. So the point I want to make with synthesis is it's a way to go from that high level specification to the actual behavior of a robot in a general way, in a way that adjusts based on what you have, based on the abstraction, based on, on the environment, based on all these pieces. If you have one task, so you can see here, kind of drop off the, the, the wheels. I'll talk more about the modular robots in a bit. Um, since if you have one task the robot is supposed to do, synthesis is not, right, is not quite the right way to do it. It's not optimized for a specific task. However, if you have a robot that's supposed to do different things and you want to change their, the, the, um, the behavior, change the design, um, kind of from day to day or from week to week, then synthesis is a systematic way of doing it. And I'm, I've kind of now started to think about synthesis more as automated design. And I, I, you know, we can, we can debate whether that's true or not, but uh, kind of that, that's kind of the, 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 what I want you to have in mind. So if I had just one task of go up the stairs and drop the, the thing into the bin, this part might not be the best solution. But if I want to have this versatility, this ability to generalize, synthesis is kind of the approach we've been taking. So let me give you a little bit more kind of uh, intuition in terms of what I mean when I say synthesis. So this is kind of um, uh, traditionally, the way you would create systems is you would have some informal specification. I want a robot to put on lipstick. You would have an expert design a system such that, you know, that is supposed to put on lipstick. And then you would create a design and then you would test it and you iterate. Right? It's never, it never works the first time. You write code, I write code, never works the first time except for one time. One time that I did something that was very funny. But and in general, you know, you have this testing loop and, and then at some point you feel confident enough that it looks like it's gonna work. Are you ever guaranteed that's gonna work? No. Can you, you know, uh, can you prove that it's gonna work? Not in this, fun, this, this uh, framework. So what are we thinking about? The way, the way I think about synthesis, not just me, the way we think about synthesis for robots is um, can we create theory and tools that automatically transform specifications into guaranteed behavior design or feedback of why, about why the specification cannot be guaranteed? So the words that are important here are the ones that are highlighted in blue. So I want to automate this. I want, like I said before, to, to create a specific controller, specific system for a specific task Synthesis is not the right way to, do, to go. But if I want to automate, if I want to create tools that automate this kind of uh, from high level specifications to a system, whatever that means, I want to automate. I want to have, I, I want to understand what specifications are. And this is kind of something I'll come back to with Maya mentioned the HRI aspect. What is it that we want the system to do? What are the specifications? What are the, the, um, the language that I use to specify what the robot should do, what the system should do, which how the system should behave? I want guarantees. Now, these are physical robots. Can I actually provide 100% guarantees? No. Do I want to say something about the system? Yes. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And then feedback. I want the, 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 these tools, this theory to tell me, you know what? You can't do this because, or this might fail because. So that kind of uh, um, ability to provide some, some information back. So this is what I'm calling formal synthesis for robots. Okay, so what are, what are the building, how, what, how, what, is, what are the things that I need for synthesis? So I need abstractions. I need um, a set of building blocks. And I'm gonna give a couple of examples of what I need by abstractions. 
I have some specifications. So the abstraction that typically would be given by an expert or some system designer. It could be given by the user. This is, by the way, my 16-year-old, uh, when she was a little bit younger, but yes, uh, very smart, but not but novice user. Um, ideally, specifications are something that the user would be able to, 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 to provide, not something that requires expertise, not something that requires a PhD in robotics. So that's the specification. And then you'd have some synthesis algorithm or a set of synthesis algorithms that produce a design. And that's great. You're getting a design, but the feedback, if I can't create a design, or if I create a design that cannot be guaranteed under certain conditions, I want that feedback to come back to me. And where does that feedback go? The easiest thing is just provide easiest. E easiest as someone who never run a, a human study, right? Easiest thing is to give uh, um, feedback to the user. Can't do this because, or just can't do this, right? Um, the next, a uh, difficult thing is to use this feedback to modify the specification. And there's a bunch of work in that space as well. So how, wh what part of the specification can I do? Can I modify the specification a little bit? So there's notion of partial satisfaction, there's, there's notion of, of, of distance, and there are many definitions of that, the automata theory and all that. But also what I would like to do, ideally if I could, was use this feedback to refine my abstraction. And we have some thoughts about that. So, um, but that is the hardest kind of uh, thing because the abstractions came from somewhere and so typically you need some expert to create those. All right, this is, I've shown this diagram in, in talks, but I probably showed it in the H one. I can't remember if it, if, it was, if, I, if it was after that that I created this diagram. But the more I think about it, the place that I think I'm most excited about synthesis, I mean, there's a bunch of places, the whole thing is exciting. But the thing that I think that is you, maybe you, more unique or I think has a lot of power is this feedback. Because a lot of times that we use with synthesis, we use formal um, abstraction, form, formal specifications that you can go do better than yes, no, or 90%, or these numbers that, that are um, super important but you can give more than that. Because you can say, you know, if you change this, then I can do it. Or you're assuming, make me, if you make this assumption, now I can do this, right? Those kind, that kind of information. And I'll just, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that when I show you the different um, things that, that, that we care, the, the different projects that we thought about in this context. So what I wanna do is I want to kind of go, um, uh, so Sam and I talked about kind of types of talks. So this talk is gonna be, um, breadth. So I want to give you examples of what I mean by abstracting specification design feedback for specific systems that we've looked at. Then I'm going to narrow down. I'm going to want to teach you something. So I mean, uh, teach you maybe that's a little bit of a strong statement, but people who never heard the word reactive synthesis or reactive LTL synthesis, I'm going to give you the five minute feel of what reactive synthesis is. Hopefully something will be retained. And if you know this already, it's only going to be five minutes. And then I want to go into a specific kind of thing that we're working on these days. And then I want to expand that out. kind of the, the, the and, and just it's perfect. I mean, one of the reasons I, I wanted to expand out this direction is because, uh, because of mine, but really the, the, the notion of, of verification synthesis for HRI, where, where, is that, where does that sit? So that's kind of the, the, the flow of, the, of this talk. Going to be very few, I think, not, no uh, equations, but, uh, and I'm happy to, of course, to chat about every, anything. Now, as, um, uh, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but um, I've been talking to a screen since uh, March, 2020. So teaching uh, lab classes and um, so on. So I very much welcome any uh, discussion along the way. I do not have to go through all my slides. I don't care about going through all my slides. I would much prefer having some interaction with you guys. So please feel free at any point to unmute or just talk. All right. So a few examples about specific, um, and I'm gonna show you three different projects um, that all have this kind of notion again of abstraction, uh, specification, synthesis, design, and, and feedback. But going from purely hardware to purely software, if you will. All right, so first example, this is kind of work with, this is uh, work with uh, Thais Campos, who's, who's a PhD student with me about to graduate. Uh, and the idea there is my building blocks are modules. 
So these are heavy robots. These are um, heavy modules. They're uh, single degree of freedom, continuous rotation. And uh, um, I can build structures out of them. So if you look at, go, go to the heavy website, or heavy is a spinoff out of uh, CMU, they have a whole bunch of really cool robots to be built. We're interested in manipulators. So you can have uh, modules, you, you have links, and you can have attachments. So you can, you can mount the, the, the um, modules in different angles. So those are kind of my, my, my building blocks, my abstraction. My specification, the first kind of the, the 2019 ICRA paper was my specification was reach a point in space while avoiding obstacles. So reaching about points, finding a design for the manipulator that reaches points in space is something that's been done many, many, many years ago. So this is not something new. The obstacles, that is something that we, we've not found in the literature. And the idea here is we put also constraint, we can put constraints on where the base is. That's one type of specification. This is a specification formalism that has points, obstacles, and constraints on the base. In RSS last year, we had um, a different type of specification where the task was composed of shape primitives. So we had shape primitives, so arcs, lines, and circles. That's the gray, what you see here, the gray rows. Obstacles, which are, which are in the red, and again, constraints on the base. And the idea was to find a manipulator that can follow the trajectory while avoiding obstacles. And this wasn't then in 2D. We did this was not 3D. So then you get something that looks like this, right? So this is the same um, uh, the same task that you just saw, the one on the left. And this is the robot that was built to avoid these obstacles. And we have a few different examples um, for that. Now, how do we do this? We do this kind of a, 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 the, the way the synthesis approach goes here. We started with program synthesis. It was a little bit of overkill. Now we're basically with a um, uh, optimization verification loop. So we, we, find, a, we, we um, find a candidate structure and we verify using motion planning that it actually can, can work. Okay, so that's kind of the idea there. But we learn from the motion planning. Actually, let me not use the word learning when I, when I see Dieter here. Not learning. <laughs> we we uh, um, use the information from the verification to actually modify the constraints on the optimization. So it is a loop. It's kind of a, if you think about this as inductive synthesis. You have a solution, you verify it. If, it. if the verification fails, you take that information and you incorporate that into the loop. And then the feedback can be, for example, and then this, this was in the ECRA paper, could be, you know what, I did not find a, sol a solution. Doesn't mean that what one doesn't exist. It's not a complete uh, um, algorithm, but I did not find a solution, but here's a solution that can reach most of the points. In this case, it can reach six out of the eight points. Or another piece of feedback could be, here are two designs that could reach all the points, but I couldn't find a design, one design that would reach all the points. So it's not so much feedback in the sense of this cannot be done, but rather, here's what I found, and here's what is missing, or here's an alternative. So that's kind of the way we're thinking about feedback here. This is the module robots that you saw before. So this is a, a, the, the hardware was built by uh, Tarek Tosun, um, who's now in some self-driving car company. Uh, these are, um, okay, let me get this one. These are s'mores, s'mores EP. And these are um, modules, so this is about, about 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, so 10 centimeter cube, uh, that has four degrees of freedom. So it has two wheels, it has a pen on, the, on one, one face, and then it has a, a hinge in the middle, so it can, it can bend. And the way we compose, so modular robots basically are robots that are composed of modules. In this case, we have um, eight. The middle one is just a passive one. The black one is it's not actuated. So we have... Um, for like sorry, eight um, uh, modules here and then enables it to be to create a holonomic drive. The way you're connecting these, so this is gonna uh, um, again Tarek's work. Um, you can see here the these half moons on the side. I think you can see my 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 cursor, right? The half moons on the side are electropermanent magnets. So these are magnets that can turn on and off with a really um, really big, really short current flowing through it. So it's it's a very it's it's pretty power efficient. So is that, and if you're aligned well, you can turn it on and off. So that's what you saw at the beginning video, the reconfiguration was done um, using these electro-permanent magnets. All right, so what about, what, about, what are, so and, and this project it was a CPS project uh, with uh, um, Mark Kiem, who did the hardware, Mark Campbell, who was more on the perception and, and um, uh, 
next best view and um, characterizing the environment. And then my, 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 my student was on the um, high level behaviors. So we want abstractions, we want specifications, we want uh, synthesis, and then we want designs and, and feedback. So our abstractions were, two, we had two abstractions. We had, well, sorry, we had the set of abstraction was, we had sensors. And this, we um, uh, basically we used the perception system to kind of give a yes, no answer. Okay, I see, I see an object, I don't see an object. I see a pink uh, blob, I don't see a pink blob. I see stairs, I don't see stairs. Or, uh, there are stairs in my, in my, in my direction. Uh, and then we had a, a, a library of configuration gates. So we had um, different configurations for the robots and each, each robot can have multiple gates, multiple patterns of actuation that create different motions in the environment. And that uh, library, and I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about how we created the library and, and I'm happy to chat about that later, but it doesn't really matter at this point. But we had that library and it was annotated with properties of each. Um, we annotated it. You can definitely use learning here to make this much richer and much more um, comprehensive, but we just didn't, uh, or we never published it. We played a little bit with some genetic algorithms a little bit. So that was the abstraction. The specifications were written in linear temporal logic. If you've never heard what linear temporal logic is, it's fine, you're gonna see it in a second. But suffice it to say that it's a temporal logic that uh, allows us to write, uh, to use um, Boolean operators and temporal operators, I'll get to that. But then you can write specifications such as always, if you see stairs, stairs was a sensor proposition. I want to be in a configuration that climbs. Always, if I see pink, I want to, pick, I want to be in a configuration that can pick up an object. There was no grasping here, it was all magnetic. So let me be fully uh, transparent here. Um, okay, so we can write specifications like that. If you'll notice, I wrote it over the properties of the configuration gates. I actually don't care the person who's writing the specification does not care what configuration and what gate we're actually gonna use. That is something that the synthesizer needs to figure out. And we can optimize based on you know, the minimum number of um, reconfigurations because reconfigurations, they're fully autonomous, but they're costly. They take time, they take time. They, they, they uh, increase the possibility of failure because you need to detach and, and attach um, modules again and again. Um, okay, so, so this is a specification. We run it through reactive synthesis, which I'll talk about a little bit in, in a bit. And then what we can do is we can provide feedback on things. For example, if I see stairs and pink at the same time, I need a configuration can, that can both climb and pick up an object. That might not exist in my library, but by synthesizing the LTL into, some, into a state machine that shows me all the com combinations that I need, now I can check whether for all the combinations that I need, I actually have library entries. I actually have a shape and a gate, a configuration and a gate that allow me to move, um, to do both at the same time. And if not, before executing, I can provide feedback. This, I need this config, I might actually not, I don't need, I might need this configuration and gate because it really depends on my sensor information. If I never see stairs, I don't care, right? But there might be a case in which I see both so I wanna make sure I have a configuration gate that matches both, and currently I don't. And then you can go back and this is kind of where you wanna go back and recreate your abstraction, right? You wanna enrich the abstraction that you have. Yeah, and then those two videos I already showed at the beginning, so let me skip that as much as I love these videos. All right, the final kind of uh, rough example that I wanna show, this is the Baxter not building anything, we're using a Baxter. Um, this is a collaboration with uh, um, Tom Howard at, uh, up at Rochester, up, I'm in Ithaca, so up is north, uh, up in, in Rochester, um, University of Rochester. And uh, the idea here was going from natural language. So can I go from natural language to robot behavior? So there are a bunch of things that are going on when you deal with natural language, as some of you in, in the audience know better than me. There's the grounding, what is the blue block, for example? That is something that's that a lot of kind of prior work, both by Tom Howard and, 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 uh, and other people. But then what we did is we um, grounded the sentences into LTL formulas. So given that we had, L, uh, um, L, we learned a mapping between utterances and LTL formulas, and then we can do reactive synthesis and create a, a specific, create a behavior. Now, what would that look like? So, okay, so this is an example. This is again, um, the Baxter. 
So it's pick up the blue block, put it on the, the on your right, pick up the red blocks and put it on, the, on your left. So you'd expect the robot to drop the blue block at this point. Um, it does not. It just goes and picks up the red one. Now, in terms of correctness, this is correct. My specification is pick up the blue block and drop it to the box on your right, pick up the red block and drop it on the box on your left. There is nothing about the relative timing here. So now it's going to drop the red block. It's going to drop it. This is real time. I should probably speed it up at some point, but um, dropping on, on, on um, dropping the red and then it's going to drop the blue. Totally correct behavior. Kind of not what we would, would expect. Doesn't kind of make, make sense. So this mismatch between it's doing what it's supposed to do versus it doesn't look like it's doing what it's supposed to do for me looking at it is a mismatch that comes up even more when you think about HRI and these kind of uh, um, specifications for HRI. So that's kind of something that we'll, we'll, I'll get back to in a little bit. What is the feedback that can come, come up here? There's a bunch of assumptions that we might, might wanna make that we can identify because we have this logical structure if, if we're missing some assumptions, we won't be able to synthesize. And then what we can do is we can transform that back into language utterances, simple language utterances. I mean, the, the natural of it, the, the, how natural it is was not the main point here. But I can say things like, I do not see a red block, so I can't pick it up. Or am I gonna see a red block eventually? Because if I don't see a red block, I can't fulfill the specification. So there's a bunch of kind of things of, of what do I need to explicitly say versus what can I um, create from the, the um, environment in which I'm grounding. I can already put some, some constraints on based on, on the environment I'm already grounding to. And what do I need to ask, right? So LTL tends to be, LTL synthesis is, is or reactive synthesis is the worst case. I, I'm only be able to create a controller if, I'm, uh, if there's no way for the environment to mess with me. So if there's some adversarial behavior for the environment, is that real? Is that something that just because it's a worst case approach? Anyway, there's a bunch of questions that come up from there. All right, so we've been using, as, as, as I mentioned, uh, we've been using a bunch of, uh, we've looked at different types of robots. Um, this is the Robotarium that um, Magnus, Magnus Eggerstadt uh, runs at, at Georgia Tech, which we, we found very useful. Um, did, a little bit of, did a little bit of synthesis on uh, the DARPA Robotics Challenge, a little bit. Um, and yeah, and there's a bunch of other other robots as well. But I also want to say, I, I mean, I'm I'm uh, in this talk. I didn't give you all the history and all the other groups that are working in this space. I, my group is by no means the only one, so I'm going to be very self-centered <laughs> and show two papers. I'm showing two papers in in, in this uh, presentation. But this is the review that we wrote. Um, it came out 2018, and there there's a whole bunch of different citations that if you're interested in all these and, and what does it mean to, to do probabilistic? What does it mean to do partial, actually not so much partial observability, but partial satisfaction. There's a bunch of people that you want to look up um, that are listed there. Okay, so that was kind of uh, broad. So let me give you, I gave you a few different examples of systems and tasks and specifications that kind of really sit, sit with this philosophy of what are the abstractions, where are the specifications, and so on. I want to go in a little more detail. I want to uh, um, talk a little bit about what reactive synthesis is. So this is, um, I'm gonna just wanna give an example of from, coming from the kind of original paper, original Rosner and Pinoelli paper. And then I wanna show an example, which is much more recent, where uh, it's synthesis, but really I wanna emphasize the feedback aspect of it. That's kind of what I wanna do. So uh, let's talk about that. There's a hallway here. So every once in a while there's, you get distracted. All right, so um, LTL, what is LTL? Um, when you think about, this is the way it's typically describe it. It is not the most technically precise, but we'll go with this anyway. Um, when you think about propositional logic, you think about propositions and each of them is either true or false. Then you can put logical operators on them, A and B, A and not B, all those possible possibilities. Now, when you think about temporal logic, these propositions, you still have these propositions that are either true or false, but their truth value can change with time. So think about this as a model that, that or as a, some transition system that right now, you know, right now Hadass is in Upson, which is the building uh, 
where my office is. Uh, but the proposition of Hadassim Upson is true, but in an hour, it's going to be false because I'm going to go home. Okay, so think about that in terms of, of representing the world using propositions. And then it can start adding temporal operators. So the main ones are next. So there's for LTL, there's the notion of a step. There's no explicit time. There are other logics with explicit time, which I'll mention very briefly. Um, so next, there is the square here is always. So something has to always be true for the, for, the, for the formula to be true. Eventually, something has to be true at some point in the future. And the until, something is true until something else is, is true. So this is LTL. Um, it is very natural to capture robot tasks using LTL. Uh, robot tasks, abstracted robot tasks, right? So if I want to say, you know, go to my office and then go to my lab and always avoid the stairs. So it's eventually this and eventually that and always not that, right? So there's a bunch of, you know, it, it's, it's a very, I don't know, it's a very intuitive is the right word to say. I've been looking at LTL for the past, I don't know, 15 years, but it is, it, it does allow you to capture uh, richness of goals beyond the kind of traditional planning of goal state. So what is reactive synthesis? Reactive synthesis is, um, the idea there is you have a, a temporal logic formula, LTL formula in this case, or in the, in the case of the reactive synthesis, this is, this is a very famous Pnueli and Rosno paper. Uh, Pnueli was a Turing Award winner, um, passed away a few years ago, unfortunately. Um, so the idea there is we have a set of inputs. If I translate this to robots, it means that sensor information, information about the environment. And we have a set of outputs, robot decisions, actions the robots can take. So it's, for us, it's very natural to distinguish between the, the um, sensor information, perception, abstracted sensor information. Uh, for, my, the student who I'm going to present his work just walked by. <laughs> it's Adam Pajek. Uh, and then, um, the outputs are decision are controls, controls, decision, uh, decisions, actions. You can use any of those words as far as I'm concerned. And then the idea is if you have a specification that includes uh, reactive synthesis, what it does, it takes a specification that is a for, uh, an LTL formula over X and Y over the set of inputs, a set of outputs, and it um, spits out a state machine, some state machines, not unique. There could be multiple of them that satisfies the specification. So what, let's look at this for a second. We have not X. If I'm starting with not X, then I wanna have not Y initial state. And always, if I see X, at some point I'm gonna see Y. And always, if I don't see Y, if Y is false, it's gonna stay false until X is true, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give you enough time to actually think about how to draw this. But this state machine that basically has y be the same as x satisfies this. Okay, so I'm starting with not x. Because if I'm starting, this is an implication. If I'm starting with x true, I'm done. This formula is true. Implication, the left-hand side, if the left-hand side is false, everything is great. So uh, if my left-hand side is true, not x, this is my initial state, then I'm going to go to not y. As long as, it, I, I, as, long as I see x is false, y is going to be false. When x becomes true, y becomes true. As long as x is true, y is true. And when x becomes false, y becomes false again. So reactive synthesis is an is a, is a algorithmic process of creating this state machine. Now for general LTL, it is double exponential in the size of the formula. We don't like that, it does not scale at all. For a specific fragment of LTL, which, um, which was uh, named uh, GR1 or generalized reactivity one, which has, this is the kind of roughly the structure, but inside there's a lot more structure. So it's not like just any formula in there. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details because it doesn't really matter. Um, but it's, it's of the form of phi e implies phi s. Phi e is assumptions about the environment. Phi s is, the, is desired behavior. And I'm kind of putting my robotic spin on it in terms of in, 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 uh, assumptions about the environment of the robot means this robot, the robot should do the following. And if you do this, then it's, it becomes a polynomial in the state space. Now, state space can be very big too, but it becomes a little more tractable. A little. It's still, you know, we're, we're yes. Scalability is a, is a constant uh, struggle uh, with these kinds of techniques. All right, so that was reactive synthesis. And what I want to show now is I want to show you kind of um, 
actually, let me let me let me take a, a slight detour of, of giving the context of this paper. So, from my PhD, my PhD work was on kind of using the reactive synthesis for for remote control. Um, from then, we were looking at everything very very abstract in the sense that perception is perfect. Perception gives me binary signals. So I have a bunch of, of propositions. They're either true or false. Someone looking at a lot of people on, on the call here uh, gave me uh, wonderful perception algorithms that tell me yes or no, okay? Um, that is of course a very simplifying assumption. So what we've done recently, and this is kind of a part of the MIRI that I'm running, um, this is a collaboration with George Kanadaris, was can we go from, um, uh, from perception? And again, perception here is again, you'll see it's, it's simplified by using April tags, but can we go from perception to create the abstraction, to create the, the behavior. So this is kind of following the, the work of George Kanadaris uh, on symbol generation. And there's other groups who are working on in the space, there's other groups who are working on skill learning, but I'm not gonna talk about that. So here, here are um, basically symbols. The idea here is you have uh, a set of skills, so those are given. Uh, the robot has a bunch of things it can do. And then what you're trying to do is you're trying to um, uh, basically, in this case, learn classifiers that tell you whether a proposition is true or false. And then given those symbols and that, those classifiers, now you can represent your, your world symbolically. And now you can start doing um, what George did in his work, in his, P, uh, I think it was PhD work or later on, um, with his work was basically used kind of planning like PDDL. So kind of um, uh, uh, chaining the different skills to get to some goal. So what we did here was to basically, uh, this is ISR paper with Adam who just walked by. But the idea is here, we have a skill, B to F, those are two locations. You do it multiple times. There's the cameras on this arm. So that's why it kind of goes into that. You collect data about where all the objects are. Again, this is cleaned up data. This is not pixels, right? This is kind of, a, this block is here, this block is here. But you collect a bunch of data, and then you learn the symbolic representation of the skill. I have this notion of precondition. What is the situation in, in which I'm allowed to, to, to create the skill, to, to run the skill? And then what happens after I run the skill? So the effect. So think about this preconditions and effects. This is very much in the planning uh, world. And then what we can do is use these as constraints on what the robot can do, on what the robot can do. And then we can write specifications over that by including additional propositions. So we have a switch, which is binary yes, no. In this case, it was, I think it was a GUI or whatever. And you can create different specifications. For example, if the switch is true, I want the purple on top of the, of the red block. If switch is false, I want red on top of the purple. And that's my task. My task is basically, I want to be either here or here, depending on my input. And then what synthesis does, it gives me the sequence of skills I need to chain given what my environment is like. So you can see when the skill is false, it's gonna bring the purple here, it's gonna bring the red there. Doesn't really matter what it's doing here because really, uh, I'm sorry, we wanted, my bad, we wanted the other one on the top of that block. So that failed. Okay, so but I said, I started this, by, by this part by saying, I wanna I care about um, feedback, right? So what is the feedback here? So the, the main thing that we find interesting and the, way, the main thing uh, Adam is working on now is actually when I cannot synthesize. So maybe I have a set of skills, maybe I have a set of skills here. And um, now for whatever reason, I have an extra constraint. A skills become unusable, um, uh, something in my environment change, maybe now I'm not allowed to put blocks in a certain area. How can I use synthesis to figure out what skill I can add back in or what skill I should learn or, or come up with to be able to fix the task? That's the question, right? What is the, what is the missing skill? What is the skill that will let me fix the task, this high level task? So this is the part where uh, I am going to do something you should probably not do in talks and basically just skip through all the slides without talking about them. So this has to do with kind of the structure and what we're looking at. And I, I wanna to get to the HRI, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna skip this. Suffice it to say that what we're doing, um, we are exploiting the synthesis algorithm and the way it builds the state machine and the way it builds the controller 
to figure out where the disconnect happens and then suggest new skills. Now we can suggest new skills in different ways. We can either, if this is my original skill, so let's look at a very simple example. I want to always eventually be at R0. So I'm at R0. Uh, I'm going to take an action A0. I don't have a self-transition here. I just can't, I can't just stay there. If I could, I'd just stay there because that makes the most sense. I can't. I'm going to take A0. A and then I, if, I, if I happen to fall on, on R1, I'm going to take A1 and, and repeat. If I happen to fall on R2, I'm out of luck. And remember, LTL synthesis is worst case. So this is unsynthesis. I cannot, given these uh, actions, I cannot satisfy this task. I cannot guarantee to satisfy this task. So there are a few things I can think about doing. We can either restrict preconditions, sorry, restrict postconditions. They basically, what does that mean? I want to go through the synthesis algorithm, realize something is wrong, and then I want the synthesis algorithm, or what we're doing is we're spitting out a suggestion. You know what? A0 has non-determinism. If you get rid of the non-determinism, you're good, right? If I get rid of this non-determinism and A0 takes me from R0 to R1, I'm good. Another option is just to learn a new skill. If I have something to take me from R1 to R2, sorry, from R2 to R1, it's great. I happen to fall on R2, fine, I'm just gonna go to R1. The other thing was to relax precondition. So if A1 that takes me back to R0 was only allowable from R1, well, if I also allow it to start in R2, that same skill, also good. Okay, all these things are suggestions for repairs that fix. Now, one of the things we're looking at now, and kind of Adam's kind of final piece of his PhD would be, um, this is symbolic. We can play around with, um, con with constraints on this, the repair that have to do with the symbolic. Maybe I want the minimum number of, of propositions to change. Maybe I want only a certain set of propositions to change. There are a bunch of things we can play around with there, but those don't really matter. What matters is the physical, right? What matters is, can I actually find a, a skill that does that? And what we're, gonna, what we're doing is we're thinking about how to connect the symbolic with the physical such that the suggestions that the symbolic provides make sense in the physical. And here we're, we're very much agnostic to how do I get the skill? So um, we're gonna be looking at kind of distances from current skills. We're gonna looking at learning. We're gonna look at kind of, you know, reinforcement learning under temporal logic constraints, kind of not our work, work from, from other people that we're gonna uh, be employing here. Um, Model-based, right? They're, they're, I, I really don't care how I get the skill. I just wanna get the skill, right? And, and here this helps, me guide, helps guide me towards which skill should I be using? So here, Maya, this is for you. <laughs> uh, the reason I put this uh, com this uh, uh, comic here, um, or, uh, first of all, it's awesome, and you know, it's, it's, it's historical and fun. Um, but first of all, I wanted to, to kind of do a transition to I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to expand again. I'm going to go kind of wider. Um, and I, I, the they're talking here. I mean, the the, the um, this comic is talking about motion planning and how motion planning can be bizarre. But I'm gonna actually take this to mean that if a person was looking at it while it was driving, they'd be, okay, the robot is done. It doesn't know, it's, it's out of control. It doesn't know what it's doing. So the HRI aspect of it is something that kind of I, uh, that resonated with me. All right, as Maya mentioned, Dachstuhl. Dachstuhl is a, is a kind of a, um, a workshop that happened, that you can propose a workshop. Uh, it's in Germany, uh, literally, Sorry, Dieter, middle of nowhere, um, which is uh, you go there for a week, you have a whole bunch of really awesome colleagues and you talk and you brainstorm. It was a wonderful week. This was February um, 2019. You can see uh, Professor Chakmak here. You can see me next to her. Uh, I will say that I'm actually standing on a stair above. So you can tell our relative heights by this. So that is, uh, <laughs> I was like, are we standing on the same height? I don't know. And then the only the other person I wanted to highlight here is Professor Henny Admoni, who I believe is giving a talk in a few weeks. Uh, I, I, anyway, I saw her, her name. So I figured, you know, I might as well uh, shout out to her because she's amazing. Definitely come to her talk. So, yeah. So um, why am I showing this? This was a collection of people from HRI, from formal methods for robotics, and from formal methods like, you know, the hardcore, you know, program synthesis, verification. Uh, and we, we spend a week together trying to think about what are the challenges, what are the opportunities of doing verification and synthesis in the context of HRI. 
because it is, it is uh, a, as you mentioned, a growing field. Um, more and more people are interested. Uh, Maya and Bill Gay and, and uh, other people in the community are doing amazing, amazing things uh, with the notion of synthesis and verification in the context of, of HRI. Um, but, but the one thing that came out of that, again, this is my second shameless plug, is um, a position paper on formalizing and guaranteeing human robot interaction. This is going to appear in communication of the ACM next, next I think it's next um, uh, issue. And I think the main thing that came out of that uh, week, and Maya, please correct me if I'm distorting anything, was um, a lot of times people from more the controls, more the, the um, formal methods for robotics view people as a dynamic obstacle. And that is not a good way to, to think about people. On the other hand, HRI community, again, very, I'm, I'm generalizing in a ridiculous way, so bear with me for, for this kind of generalization. HRI community, they think a lot about user studies and, and uh, showing um, efficacy and, and different properties of human robot interaction, and they're super rigorous, but there's not really a notion of specification. What is it that defines human robot interaction? What is the thing that I could verify? What is the thing that I can synthesize? Again, very general. I'm generalizing a lot, and it's not quite right what I'm saying. But as a general, as a general, um, as a general statement, take it with a grain of salt. But roughly, that's where we see the disconnect. And there's a huge opportunity here, a huge opportunity here. And what are the things that we we find? We again, this is a, the view of the people who, uh, who wrote this um, wrote this paper. This is this is a subset of the doctoral participants. Um, a few things that we found exciting to explore. What is formal specification for HRI? And the thing that stuck with me the most, and um, uh, Todd Murphy from, from Northwestern uh, talks about um, physical HRI for therapy. And then the question, there, there's a question of, to have effective therapy, you want to assist, but not over assist. So what does it mean? How do I capture the property of not over assisting? I can think about this in, in many different domains as well, but that is that, 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 that's kind of an example that stuck with me a lot because safety, you know, don't, don't exert more than a certain amount of force on a, on a, on a person. Yes, that, that is, we know how to think about that. But properties that are inherent to the HRI aspect, to the I aspect, the interaction aspect of it, those are, um, there's a huge opportunity to formalize those. Um, so what is the space of specification? What are the right uh, formalism to even use? Do you definitely need time? So that's something that we figured out kind of a, with a project that uh, I did with, with Laurel Rick at, um, at UCSD. Um, you definitely need some notion of, uh, you need some continuous metrics. You need time, you need, how do you incorporate fluency? How do you incorporate uh, uh, distance? How do you incorporate, um, um, anyway, a bunch of different things. Adaptation is something that's really, really interesting because um, you would want the robot to adapt to the person, but the person will adapt to the robot. And this adaptation needs to be incorporated somehow in the model. So formal synthesis requires models. And how do we incorporate this, non this change over time and different timescales? You know, I'm, I, you know, I'm just you know, so tired that I'm not, uh, I won't be able to, to, I need more help or versus long-term, okay, I get the feeling, you know, I, I know what you're doing. So. This kind of notion of adaptations and timescales is very, very important. And finally, the notion of variability, right? I am not the same size as my students physically. So if I need physical rehabilitation, I need something different. I have a different, I'm coming from a different culture than some of my, some of my students or some people uh, here. That has to be incorporated because interaction is not in a vacuum. There is cultural considerations. There are um, ability, ability levels, there are, um, there are preferences, right? Beyond there's the cultural, there's the, the, the societal, there's the personal, there's so many things that you have to take into account. And the question is, how much do you need to take into account? What are the things that are more universal that you can assume? For example, attention on the road. If you're looking at your phone, you're probably not paying attention regardless of where you are in the world. But, do I remind you? Do I scare you? Do I, what, how do I react to that? Might be societal, right? Or might be cultural. A bunch of questions come, come up from there. 
Um, so we, we've had, you know, um, this is very centric to, to my group, but, you know, like I said, uh, Maya has a bunch of really, really great work um, in this space as well. But what I wanted to show you is a few examples to show that the abstraction, the, the, the specification that we use are not necessarily the same. So we used STL, so this is signal temporal logic. This has a notion of, dis a notion of continuum. You can define continuous variables to, uh, to, to encode handover behaviors. STL. This is uh, Alap, um, who is Guy Hoffman's student. Um, uh, this is a collaboration with, with Guy Hoffman at Cornell. Uh, SMT encoding. This is a different type of encoding that has pretty efficient solvers that allows, again, to, to incorporate some continuous metrics, continuous variables into the encoding. And then we use some LTL when, when the, um, this is their work with the uh, uh, Laurel Rick at, at UCSD on creating this kind of um, ability for clinicians to program the robot in a kind of a therapy uh, situation. So this was, these are studies with the clinicians, not with the patients, of course, to see the, how the clinicians uh, um, reacted to this kind of synthesis where it was very clear that, for example, the fact that we didn't have any timing was bad. So there was a bunch of things that, that uh, maybe in hindsight were not that surprising, but it was, it was good to get validation from clinicians, from the actual users um, of this. Okay. So yeah, so I want to close with a couple of kind of more. So that was very much HRI focused, and I think that is such a that's such a, a ripe and exciting area to think about. Um, not only because HRI is in general blooming, but also that specific marriage of of thinking about how to formalize some of these things. I think HRI is at a space that it's that is just ripe for that because there's a lot of understanding of what's going on um, with interaction. All right, guarantees. I talked about guarantees at the beginning. So these are a few of my, really, guarantees. So this is perception fails. This is, I love this video. I love that Boston Dynamics just puts out all their, their bloopers, I love it. Mechanisms fail. People fail. So this is kind of a famous HRI uh, paper in which um, the researchers put a, a robot in a, in a mall in Japan and the kids were not being kind to it at all. So there's some kicking involved and, and so on. So guarantees with an asterisk. What can we guarantee? What assumption am I making? What falsification? Under what conditions do I know it's gonna fail? Trying to kind of uh, uh, tighten the envelope on what we can say about the system is something that these kinds of techniques can help with. So not so much it will never fail because I don't believe in that. I've never believed in that by the way, but rather start to um, uh, be systematic and, and be principled about what are the assumptions that we're making, what guarantees can we do, provide these assumptions, and so on. Abstraction scalability, I mentioned the notion of scalability. And then the spaces, right? So we talked about human orbit interaction. Uh, this fits into assured autonomy. This fits into automated design. It fits just like all these kind of really interesting, really growing communities that are um, exciting. So this is work with a, a lot of people. <laughs> this is a uh, this is you can see the, the length of my hair tells you how far long it, how, how long ago it was. So this is the oldest. This is the second oldest, and this is uh, this is from a couple years ago. Hopefully, we're gonna have uh, outdoor. Everybody's vaccinated. Yay! Um, uh, new picture uh, with the dinner in my house um, for next time. But yeah, and a bunch of funding agencies. And um, yeah, let me stop with there. And happy to take any questions. That was awesome. Um, <laughs> any questions? First of all, thanks a lot. Uh, awesome talk. Uh, yeah, I really you. like the specifications in there. Um, one question, I guess you mentioned it also early on that the, the kind of the grounding is one of the, the problems, right? Like you have this symbolic representation and then for the robotics aspects, you have to now ground these behaviors in execution, be robust, let's say, execution in the real world. And now if you go to HRI, then it, it seems like it's becoming even harder, right? Because the grounding now means that you have to recognize these symbolic entities, right? That you're describing and you have to from maybe visual data or so you have to recognize yeah. what is the state of the person? What is the goal of the person in order to apply this whole framework? Um, do you have any thoughts on, on how we could go about that? So I think this is where feedback comes into play really, really well in the sense that um, you want to, so actually, so for the grounding itself, it's a hard problem. I don't have a lot of really thought, good thoughts about how to uh, go from person to symbolic state of person. 
uh, the only the thoughts I have are coming kind of more from this from the uh, synthesis symbolic state. So, first of all, what do I actually need? Are there things that I'm kind of regardless of what uh, the symbolic can, can I abstract away? Can I make it more coarse? In which case, I'm less likely to fail. So, what the level of the abstraction is is super important because the more fine grained, the more computation expensive it's going to be, but also more errors might create. It's much easier to make the wrong. Uh, symbolic call. So what is the what, what is the granularity in which I can get away with it by actually providing useful behaviors, but but kind of making every everything else down the pipeline um, easier. That's kind of one thing. The other thing is feedback. So insert so um, the what I okay. So I really really like learning algorithms that provide um, confidences. Right, because once you start dealing with that, then you can start dealing with um, more probabilistic representation. So there's a bunch of probabilistic uh, synthesis techniques using um, MDPs and, and so on. Um, and then thinking about um, uh, where the where. So it's two things. It's where do I have uncertainty, and what's the price of that uncertainty? Right. If 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 the if the failure, and this is kind of also a definition. Of, that's one of the things I meant, I forgot to say, but. Um, in the formal specification, also one thing we don't really have a good definition of yet is what is failure. So for a robot moving around an uh, environment, crashing into the wall is failure. That is very easy to define. But for a social robot, what does failure mean? Do I, if I talk over you, is that is that ter ter terrible? I mean, I do that all the time. I'm Israeli, right? That, that's kind of what we do. But if if you know if you're talking to another Israeli, they're like be like, yeah, whatever. But if you're talking maybe for a different in a different culture, that is like a really big no-no. So there's, there's kind of the question of failure. And I think that um, this holistic view of what can we provide feedback on? What are, what are the uncertainties and what are the cost of being wrong? And then our abilities in terms of the grounding, that's kind of the, the way the whole thing has to be kind of, um, because to some extent, there's a lot of work on verification on kind of bounding, um, giving, um, uh, over approximations on kind of what the, what the state is. And those would be safe, but super conservative, super conservative. So uh, do you want that? Probably not. So yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a super interesting space to, to kind of think about, yeah. Thank you. I had a quick comment. I was um, meeting with Ras Bodek last week and he was telling me how um, you know, synthesis is solved. It's all about debugging the spec. And I, I didn't quite remember this emphasis on feedback in your talk, but it, it's exactly that. Like he was talking about iterative specification, like how you get the user to improve their specs. And a lot of his recent research is kind of looking at that. Yeah. But you kind of went back one step further um, talking about changing the abstractions based on the feedback which I mean, needs to involve the expert, but um, that's it's interesting him coming from programming languages where we take the languages as given, like that's, that's not, we're not gonna change that. There's no feedback to that, but it's interesting how maybe we should think about how, you know, trying to synthesize things, how that like the implications on how languages could be better. Uh, so that was one thought. But yeah, and I think to some extent, uh, Elena Glassman looks a little bit at those kinds of things, right? So it's, it's synthesis for HCI. And I think part of the process, it's, I don't think it's an automated process, but it's part of the process of doing user studies and, and all that is also kind of figuring out, I think, some part of the, the, the abstraction, right? So, mm -hmm. but yeah, but I think, but I, I don't know if Russ said that synthesis is salt. I don't know that I agree, will agree with that. Maybe. Or some, maybe. For so specific languages, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> The languages and space. Yeah, yeah. I think I think once you put in a physical system, there's a bunch of things that, uh, especially if you want. I mean, nothing. By the way, nothing about this is real time. Nothing. This is all offline synthesis, and then you can run it real time. But uh, uh, these are not uh, particularly fast things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you so much for, for being here and for your attention. And thanks for inviting me. This does not come instead of me actually visiting you, Deb. Oh, yeah.